Today, it's metamorphosis. We discuss mixed media on Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. As always, I appreciate your stopping by, and I want to remind you that today's episode, as with every episode, we'll have a blog post associated with it, show notes as it were, at behindtheshot.tv, where you will be able to see a small gallery of images created by my guest today, and a small bit that I wrote about our guest today. So that's pretty much it for the intro. I do want to remind you, Don Komarechka and I are doing photo critique shows. And the way that we're doing it is we're utilizing Flickr. If you join Flickr, and it can be the free account or the paid pro account, they do need help to stay afloat. So join the pro account. I do recommend it, but either one works. Once you are a Flickr member, join the behind the shot group and submit your images to the group. That's step number one is getting your images into the behind the shot group on Flickr. The second thing that you need to do, because it's entirely possible that you'll submit a, a photo to the group, but you don't really want to hear a critique on it. So what we're asking you to do is tag it with a Flickr tag, BTS critique. It's all one word, not a hashtag. Flickr has their own tagging system. Do that, and that's how we're finding the images for people who actually want their images to be eligible for the critique shows with Don and I. We are streaming those live on the Behind the Shot YouTube channel, and actually the day I'm recording this, we're about to record the March one coming up on March 5th. So if you're catching this after March 5th or April or whatever it is whenever this show goes live, make sure you run by the Behind the Shot to YouTube channel as well. One other thing I want to mention before I bring my guest in, this is kind of an aside, the shirt that I'm wearing. Let me get it to where you can see it. Traveler Guitars. I was at the NAMM show walking around with Scott Kelby and we came across the Traveler Guitars booth. And Scott happens to own a couple of Traveler Guitars, I think more than one. Rick Salmon owns Traveler Guitars. And we were talking to Gil at the Traveler Guitar booth and I mentioned to him that I do a podcast and of course Scott Kelby being who Scott Kelby is. And he was kind enough to give me a shirt and I think he sent one to Scott Kelby as well. So Gil, thank you very, very much for the shirt. I wear it proudly. It ends out Traveler Guitars is literally right around the corner from the radio station that I work at in Redlands, California. So if you're looking for kind of a small, compact guitar, these things are really, really cool. Uh, and that brings me to today's guest. Now, for today's guest, before I actually bring him on and introduce him, <clears throat> I've got to do a small intro. I have a friend by the name of Scott Heath. Scott is like this PR genius guy, and he represents a lot of people, and he's friends with a lot of people in the industry. And Scott kindly refers people to be to me to be on the show all the time because he just knows so many amazing photographers. And when he first turned me on to this guest and I went and looked at his website, I lost an hour probably just browsing through. This guy's work is that amazing. And what I was looking at was actually more photojournalism and documentary black and white type stuff for, for what this guy's done in his career. And then I found out about the type of work that we're going to talk about today. So it is an extreme pleasure to welcome Colin Finlay to the show. Colin, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very, very good. And <clears throat> again, you, you have a body of work that is literally second to none. You are a photojournalist, <laughs> documentary mm. photographer, documentary filmmaker, is that kind of how you describe yourself? Or I guess I should say, how do you describe yourself? Yeah, musician, composer, all that falls into there as well. So it's um, there's some multiple hats, you know, that, that I wear in terms of, you know, who we are moving forward. I think it's multimedia creatives. I think it takes on a lot of different identities. And those are certainly a few that I would fall under. Your, your photojournalism work in particular to me, by the way, you, you have – people go go to his website which is colinfinlay.com it's f i n l a y and your your documentary film work photography work there's some that are you know hard to look at as you document the struggles in and around the world right war, war conflicts the environment culture disappearing traditions famine genocide i mean you've yeah. you've seen it all right <laughs> As I was reading up on you, one of the things in your bio that it mentions is that you have done all of this work from Antarctica to the Arctic Circle and 95 countries in between. Yeah. Your your travel miles must be amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's about I think two and a half million or something. Wow. In that range, but 
you know, that's, that's what it takes to get there. You have to tell the stories. So that's part of the, you know, part of who and what the difficulty is in traveling, getting to some of these places, but it's, that's what you got to put in the time. And, See, you um, said telling the story. Now, photo, to me, every photograph should tell a story, but that's really the the inherent purpose of photojournalism and documentary photography yeah. is to tell a story. And that's one of the things to me about your photojournalistic work that's amazing is there are there are times in these war-torn countries or whatever it is that the story is is hard to see but needs to be seen. And then at the same time, you have, you know, kids playing in a war torn area and it's, it is truly, truly striking what you do photographically. I'm kind of curious. What is the, what is the one, and I'm sure they all do, but if you were to really say there's one body of your photojournalistic work, Bosnia or whatever it is, What's the one section that you think really stands out and represents you as a photojournalist? Wow, uh, you know that's a that's a, that is a tough question, Steve. I've never been confronted with that. To think, uh, you know, it's in so many of these photographs, Steve. I'm looking for that needle of hope, looking for that one image that comes in into this space and time. And I'm open to that and I'm looking for that image that has a ring of positivity to it. We have the war, we have the genocide, all those things are absolutely horrific to even contemplate bringing those into this world and bringing those through my camera and into my soul. But looking for those one specific image, two specific images that really alter my perception and most importantly, give some type of hope. There's many other photographers that photograph towards the war and I sometimes feel that my back is behind them and I'm photographing in the other direction and the cause and the effect of war and what it's doing to people what it's doing to children. And, you know, it's an incredibly important voice that I want to bring that's, you know, unique to what it is that I'm trying to communicate. But You succeed, sir. You succeed on a very high level. You are a speaker. You're an educator. You're a musician. You did a TED talk, as I recall. Yeah. And awards and accolade wise, Emmy nods. Explain the yeah. Emmy nods to me. Uh, I was uh, I was I was shooting video, rolling video in uh, 1997. So for me, my video work goes all the way back to there, working for local news stations here in Los Angeles, from MSNBC, CNN, Fox, a lot of different networks here that I started to freelance for. Um, it's a very long story, but somehow, amazingly enough. Was I did a story and assignment for Natural History magazine. So I had 15 cameras that Canon had given me, and I had 300 rolls of film, Tri-X, that Kodak had given me. And I went over to put these cameras and this film into the hands of the children who survived the siege of Sarajevo. So long story short, somehow my images, and that'll take too long, they end up getting into the executive producer at Fox Television. Fox was very different back in 1997 than what it is today. Um, she phoned me up out of the blue after three different people stole this image off of her desk that was a Christmas card and said, I have to purchase this image. Who is this guy? So she phoned up. Can I purchase the image? And by the way, what else are you doing? It's like, oh, actually, I'm leaving for Sarajevo in another two weeks. She's like, really? She says, we've always wanted to do a project on Sarajevo, but we never had the local angle. We need that to tell that story. She goes, God, what would you think about sending a reporter and a videographer, and they're going to shadow you on your entire assignment in Sarajevo. So that opened up that incredible door, you know, for me to be over there. So for me to end up being the subject of this documentary that became a half hour piece and it won all sorts of accolades and awards. And the news director, as I was leaving, said, you know, hey, you got this. Have you ever thought about video? He says, if you ever think about video, all we need to do is teach you what comes before that perfect moment and what comes after it. And I have people here that, that can do that. We're the number one station, number two market in the entire country, and I'm rolling out this opportunity for you. What do you think? So a couple of weeks later, it was like, yeah, I took him up on his offer. I got an amazing tutelage with a lady called Patty Ballas who brought me in, taught me everything that she knows. And then I was off and running hundreds of live shots, thousands of live shots. I mean, from 4 a.m. till 2 a.m. in the morning. Over in Darfur as well, I took the whole camera and projects over there because I started to do dual projects. So I was working on another project. I told the news director I'm going to Darfur 
do this project and news director who asked me to come on board is like, well, what's going on in Darfur? Explain it to him. He's like, wow, do you think you can get a reporter in there? It's like, well, I'm not sure. It really helps to have two passports because you're flying over two different zones. So you need to have, so luckily I have a British and I have an American passport. So that worked well for me. So it was very easy for me to do that. Um, long and short, it was an incredible, incredible, you know, difficult and powerful experience to say the least. And, um, we came back, turned it into two six or seven minute specials. Um, Doctors Without Borders had operators on hand. We put that into 4 million people's homes and raised $125,000 for Doctors Without wow. Borders. So that really, that really did something that my photography could never do, no matter what magazine it was in. It could never reach right, 4 right. million people and it couldn't raise $125,000 for Doctors Without Borders. So that really launched me into. Then I started to go do projects in the earthquake in El Salvador, a story on AIDS in Thailand at the Buddhist AIDS temple. So I started to run a lot of my journalistic stories, and I was doing live reporting phone-ins to the news station at night at 10 o'clock. I was doing a written piece, photographic piece for a magazine, and I was doing a whole video story for the uh, news station and bringing that home and sending those tapes back and forth through Dallas and other countries to run the video. So for about four years, it was solid photojournalism and it was you know creating all these stories for um you know for television for cnn and foxes and there's one thing i saw in your bio i also want to ask about before we get into actual photography the the photograph that we're going to talk about today i saw something about a knighthood (laughs) oh there see see i got that reaction uh are you a knight yeah yeah really um yeah so you're Sir Finley? Uh, n- not while I'm alive, no. But, you know. Interesting. <laughs> it's, it, okay. It's it's an uncomfortable thing sort of for me that I, um, yeah. The bio thing is nothing, something I'm terribly fond of. They're just a, a way to describe ourselves and other people looking at our work. And sometimes it's easier to, to do so. But um, it was a tremendous honor to go. There's no words you know, to share what that coming into my life and what it was ultimately about, which is my dedication to humanity and the environment also in particular. And it comes from the uh, Knights of Malta. So for that um, tremendous honor, you know, I will be um, in deep and tremendous gratitude the rest of my life. I I can uh, say you're honestly the first knight I've had on the show. What's that last bit, Steve? I said you're you're the first night I've had on the show. Oh, hopefully not the last. Hopefully, hopefully not. not the last. So yeah. let's get into photography for a second, because with you doing the type of photography that you do, and by the way, just so that everybody knows, I wanted to touch on the photojournalism side before we got into today's work, because today's work is completely different from that, right? So, and I'm hoping to get Colin back on sometime with one of his, you know, iconic photojournalistic uh, images. But I wanted to touch on that because it really rounds out where we're going to go with today's shot, which is, like I say, a a complete variant on that. So let's start here. You traveling the world, what what do you shoot? What's your go-to camera body and lens? If you could only have one body and one lens, what would it be? Um, For the core of what I did, um, what's crazy enough as well, Steve, is that during that time from 2005 to 2006, I did a tremendous amount of advertising work. So I really crossed over from documentary into lifestyle advertising in a massive way, going from, you know, working on my own in a place, um, doing a project on these, uh, on the gauchos in Argentina out on the Pampas. And then for the right client to see that post 9-11 to say, we want to bring authenticity back to advertising. That was what they did. And they brought me over and said, we want you to do exactly what you did with these with the gauchos, but we want you to do that in the North Shore of Oahu with 10 of our contract surfers. We're going to thread in five or six models. And, you know, at, at that point, you know, I was $43,000 in credit card debt and I was living in my car. So to have that opportunity, to have that massive challenge to go from working on your own in the Pampas to 28 people on my crew And half a million dollars spent on me delivering this ad campaign started off a whole other journey with advertising. I mean, I'm talking, I've done car campaigns in downtown LA, closing streets and huge Kodak campaigns and 
all sorts of other crazy, you know, pieces along with it that thread into this whole story. So it's all so, of the So considering itself. all of that and that you're not doing a lot of photo, uh, you know, you're not the commercial photographer, as it were, what you're known for today with yeah. your photojournalistic stuff as you're traveling or even the image yeah. today, what would be your go-to camera body? That would probably be something in the 1DS Mark III. And if you had to lock me in, I would say the 3514. Oh, interesting you know, choice. L okay. is what I would go with. I mean, pretty much during the 90s and 2000s, it was pretty much two camera bodies, a fixed 2818 and a fixed 3514. And those two would just rotate from shoulder to shoulder. And, and you're was, a Canon shooter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they've, been, they've, been, Are, they've been incredibly supportive of my career from just about day one. I found myself at WPPI this past week, mostly at the Canon booth. They yeah. were so supportive of me doing interviews. I got four interviews with different Canon Explorers of Light and people at Canon, five interviews. And wow. uh, I tried to go to other booths, but Canon was just so receptive to me. I loved it. So is there any specific tool that you use other than your camera or lens? I mean, do you use flash? Do you use anything like that? Uh, not in my documentary environment, any of that kind of work. No. I mean, that's not something I'm going to incorporate at all. I mean, it's, um, when I'm doing some of these ad campaigns, I'm working, you know, in some of these campaigns, Steve, it's, there's a real naturalness to light and there's a real movement of sun and how it reflects and works. So when I'm using lights, I'm going to use something, you know, I'm going to use Akina flow is what I use. Which is a hot lighting. Light. So I use Akina flow and I also use when I'm doing these campaigns and there's, there's a lot on the line. I, I work with either an eight or a 10 foot, what I just call it a satellite dish is that pro photo eight oh, foot yeah. wide, 10 foot wide. And that's where just where the magic for me happens. And when I'm on a campaign for gray New York or whatever, and it's on set, those are things I'm going to be bringing into that. And that's the favorite light source that I normally go to, which is a combination of Kina flows and the pro photo with the, um, what I, I just call it the satellite dish. Okay. So let's go into today's shot a second. This shot, when I first saw it was, was intriguing and confusing and <laughs> it kind of brings you into the story because of the, the girl's look in it. And yet the stuff in the background, when you look at it closely and then whatever's on top, there's so much happening here. Does this shot have a name? Um, it's generally known for the, uh, the actress who's in the image, which is Nev Campbell. Okay. So she's so, the, um, Nev Campbell. And for, for those of you on an audio feed, if you're on the video feed, you'll see this. This is one of those shots. I'll warn the audio feed. I say it every time, but this time I really, really mean it. This is one of those shots that there's so much happening. It's going to be very, very hard for me to describe this in words. I'll try, but you're probably going to need to go to the blog post to check it out. So uh, let me give this a shot. But again, this is the hardest image I have ever had to try to describe <laughs> and do justice to. It's a photo of a girl in jeans. Ends out to be actress Nev Campbell. A coat. She's got a scarf <laughs> or a cape type thing on. She's walking from she's on the right rule of third walking or looking like her her bodice area is facing the left side of the frame but her, she's looking back over her left shoulder i mean right down the barrel of the camera it's amazing the look that she's got and there's something in the eyes that's that's striking there she's in like a dirt landscape area but there's barbed wire going across the frame in front of her and on the other side of the barbed wire there's some machinery in the sand and then some water and then what looks to be a, a construction site or some other uh, site on the other side of the water. And then, and then, I don't know how to phrase this, but on top of that, on top of all of it, is something like the, like, like, a burning effect or a goo effect around all the edges of the frame. It really is just stunning mixed media. So, so let's break this down a little bit here. First of all, what is on the frame? The actual, what you described as the, the, the overlay. Did, by the way, did I do it justice? Yeah, it's, it's really 
honestly, I've never heard it from that perspective. So to see and to hear your description is really quite interesting because there's some really interesting, I think, unique facts that, you know, went down in the making of this photograph and how it was created and what it was created for. So it's very intriguing to hear your description. So thank you for that. That was really interesting to hear. Really, really lovely. Um, the overlay on this started, Steve. It's, um, I'll probably describe that. Then we may end up stepping back into where it came from and what the whole inspiration behind all of this. Cause I've probably done. Actually, should we start there? Should we start what this, with what this was shot for? Yeah. I mean, definitely that's, um, Let's and, go. And let's would, start there, and then we'll get yeah. into the technical side. Okay, because I, I wouldn't actually know what I'd done in that space. Um, I just had a wonderful museum exhibition, probably a hundred of my images on the environment, and um, at this incredible museum. And they asked me to do this project before my presentation for the museum for a group of veterans. And there's a really incredible Arts for Veterans program, and it's really inspiring for the veterans to get involved with paint, with creativity just thinking out of the box. So it's really gave this presentation to a group of veterans, which was really wonderful. Um, but they asked me to present all of my illustrations, all of my painting. It's like, my God, actually, when I put that whole folder together, I never showed it, but God, there were 275 painted illustrations that I have created so far. We narrowed it down to about, you know, 40 or 45 that we actually showed, but um, it's been a really large body of work that I've been sort of running in the background it really became inspired from what would have been about a 12 year old girl sitting across from me um, as I was flying back from San Francisco, I was consulting for a university up there on their and teaching on their masters and um, documentary um, program. And I'm sitting in the plane directly across from me is this 12 year old girl, 10 different color fingernails, 20 or 30 different colors in her hair. And she's got her phone and she's holding it up and she's dodging and burning her chihuahua in the backseat of her mother's Escalade. And that was like, wow, okay. Our profession, our tools, our trade, everything just exponentially changed in one five second experience of looking at this young girl who was fully empowered doing her stuff, making her magic happen, which is great. But it's like, okay, this is really evolving. This is really changing. Shortly after that, I met with the, uh, the director of photography at uh, Wired Magazine. And she mentioned to me, it's like, she's struggling with photography. She's struggling with photographs, with prints. She said, in my office, she goes, I've got 53 portfolios lined up from photographers. And... All of them are a McDonald's Happy Meal. They're done with the same profiles, the same inks, the same papers are all very, very similar. So there's nothing. I could choose any one of those 53 and I get the same look. So I says that. So between seeing that, hearing her feedback and her look for, I'm looking for something further. I'm looking for something beyond. Seeing this young girl with what would have been our tools in her hands, dodging and burning Chihuahua. It's like, this is going to take this movement. And at that point, I was spending a lot of time on the street, Steve, in Hollywood where I lived. And I was really chronicling what I felt were the last glory days of Hollywood. All the murals, the street art, all the different things that were on that street, those messages coming from people, from all these incredible individuals, men and women, teenagers, these artists who were out there pouring their hearts out onto the streets of Hollywood. So this really started to trigger this idea. And it was looking at that first photograph I did of Robert Kennedy Jr., that I did for, for Vanity Fair and I just had it on my table and it's like, this has got to go somewhere else. I need to bring the hands back to this photograph. Obviously it comes from years I spent working in the dark room, doing my own prints, all that stuff. So it's like, yeah, all we're doing now is catching a print as it comes out of the copier. It's like, I need to bring my hands back into this and I need to take this someplace. So inspired by all the street art, all the stories that I was writing, chronicling those glory days of Hollywood before they left. This young girl, Wired Magazine, this has got to go someplace else. There's got to be another space this is going to move into. And that's really what I started to do with that first picture of uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is taking it to another space, 
then eventually it graduated into the whole project on the boulevard in Hollywood. And that became an entire book and project and God, 70 or 80 stories that I wrote over a three and a half, four year period. So everything just started to become fluid and become in motion. And with that portrait of Nev, that really, that photograph takes place at the tar sands in Alberta, Canada. So I was up there, she was up there for a company organization called Forest Ethics. They're up there trying to work on the idea of what's happening, what this whole idea of this pipeline is about, where the oil is, what the tar sands are about, what it's doing to the environment, what it's doing to animals. So that's what, what the machinery is here? It's, it's oil yeah. machinery? Yeah. Yeah. And so then, of course, what I did when I got back, Steve, is I got used engine oil. And the used engine oil is on that print. Then I have oils on that print. I have Himalayan pink salt grinded into that print. And then the one of the final touches, you know, in this piece was furniture polish. So that's sort of where those four or five basic ingredients. And again, there's acrylics is involved as well and, and a gouache. So everything is in fluid, everything's in motion, and everything's liquid. And again, it really took me back into that dark room experience. And then for me, created something that was a unique one of one original. And that's something that I really wanted to explore in reference really to, you know, that director of photography saying, you know, the hand of photography has been removed. So that's part of exploring that part of being influenced by the street art that I was seeing, the street exhibitions that I was seeing, and really just, just trying to understand that mindset and the philosophy because it is, to me, it's very intriguing because I'm very, I guess, obsessed with numbers and with ideas. And, you know, it's, um, at a, at a blue chip gallery on La Brea, wonderful exhibition there. The guy printed 2000 posters, sold three, gave away two. Five miles down the road is a street artist having an exhibition, blue chip place. That artist sold 1000 posters at $35 each. And he sold other series from other pieces. So it's like, Okay, these industries, photography, three posters sold, collectors, street art, a thousand posters sold, 35,000 just in that space alone, and the other prints that he sold. So it's like, where is this? Is there a space in between these two, you know, lines of demarcation? So it's just interesting what one body of people creates as value and sees as value and someone doesn't see as value. So there's just so many of these interesting things are just flying around and it was, you know, a very prolific period, you know, for me. And it was. How long ago did you make this? Um, probably six, seven years ago. Okay. That one. So now, and see, and this is so where it gets, in, this is where it gets interesting because like you hadn't heard a text description of the image before. Yeah. I don't know that, you know, it's always interesting to me. It's part of the reason Don and I do the critique shows is it's always interesting to me to see how other people see your work. Right. I mean, <laughs> art is subjective. Yeah. And both in good and bad, people see different interpretations of things. But there are some things in this image that strike me bril- as, I mean, brilliant, right? There's different angles happening within this image all at the same time. So let me let me explain. The girl is 100% straight up. Yeah. The barbed wire is angled from slightly higher, close to her shoulder, down to the left, starting on the right, going down to the left. So that's a a downward left angle. The horizon line is an ever so slight Dutch angle, but it's tilting the opposite way from the left down to the right. And you get this this conversion of of camera angles almost that just make it leap off of the page. I do have a question on, on Nev for this particular shot because her face does look lit. Is that natural light or did you, did you add light here? <laughs> it's, it's all natural. I'm, I don't even, a flash never even gets on an airplane with me. Okay. So that, that brings me into a question that relates to this one. Yeah. As, a, as somebody who does the photojournalistic type stuff, and this is very photojournalistic in a way, while at the same time being mixed media, right? Yeah. When you, when you walk out, and you go into an area where you're going to do a shoot like this one with Nev. Is there something specific you're looking for 
in the natural light. To choose where to put your model, to choose where to have your model face, etc. Quite frankly, that's a very uh, compelling question, and it's a very um, the I answer gotcha. to that is going to be very no. It's quite unusual because I'm dealing with and working with an amazing actress who is from Canada, who's giving her heart, life, and blood and soul and going up there and getting behind this effort at Forest Ethics. So she's up there. The, the other important people at Forest Ethics are there. We're meeting with First Nations people, understanding what's happening, what they feel, what's happening in their ecosystem, their lives. Right. And you're driving around this incredibly corporate, industrialized area, which is a veritable no man's land. And it's a real no-go situation. So I'm working with a wonderful person in NEV who's got a huge heart and soul for this. I've got to absorb the fact that I maybe this is my only chance to photograph her. Back of the helicopter, side of the road, all of that is useless. I've got to get one image. I've got one opportunity, one shot to get one compelling image to go, to go home with that the client's going to have that they have me for. And I know when I pull off the side of this road, I'm going to give myself maybe 30 seconds to create this image all in because we're more than likely going to get arrested because we're, okay. we're, we're cross, we're trespassing on private property. A week later, I was in 120 mile per hour car chases doing the same thing, trying to get out to save my, and save my equipment to save myself because I was in that same situation or something else that I wanted to photograph close up. So I knew that this is a really dangerous place. I did not want to get her arrested, us arrested. So believe it or not, that entire shoot with Nev to get that portrait, there's only seven images, period. And it took 18 seconds. So you jumped out, snapped and got out of there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and, and, I and knew by the way, I meant was, and I knew what the light again? reading was. I knew what the light reading was because I, I, I took a pop with my handheld meter because I, I shoot everything on manual. So for me, the second I, I get out of the car, I'm popping on this. I'm popping on the light meter. Okay, what have I got? Okay, six three, it's six forty. It's like now six forty is going to be too much. Roll it back to three twenty. One or two test shots. Get Nev in. Three photographs. Looking off camera. One photograph. She's looking at me. Second photograph. She's looking a little bit above me. Next photograph, six and seven, she's looking profile. She's out. We're running for the car. Were you directing her looks or she was just looking around? I asked her to look at me in those last two. So this is what I would consider, obviously, an environmental portrait. Right. right. The, first, the first three images, she's looking off. She's getting ready for me. And then she just turns and just hits with that powerful gaze that just, you know. Oh, you know uh, right? Yeah. That look yeah. sucks you into this picture and actually – Let's talk composition really quick before we close out here, because there's a lot going on compositionally here, right? She's yeah. on the right rule of third, and she goes from the bottom of the frame, except for the mixed media down there, to about the intersection of the top and right rule of third. The machinery is on the left rule of third. The barbed wire crosses the center line at an angle through the rule of third. The horizon line is not centered, except that because of the Dutch angle, it goes to center, but goes up towards the rule of third. Um, th there's media below her that balances the media above her. There's so many things you did in here compositionally that I just absolutely, I'm serious. This is, this is an amazing, the barbed wire was really there, right? That's not oh, an added later. I've no, not in a million years. Okay. It's there, of course. So processing wise, this was shot on digital yeah what would you have done to this shot in post if anything yeah i mean that's the whole thing even the brightness in her face that you were talking about that was part of the reduction from the sponge because she had some extra paint on her face that i didn't want so i brightened her face up simply by the sponge going over her face so that's why it looks like it's lit because it's a bit luminous but that's because there was paint that was on there. I took that layer off and took a bit of the color off from the paper as well. So, you know, those are sort of the things that, that sort of happen. But these, 
you know, that's, that's the whole thing. I mean, for me, I know other people love Zooms. I mean, I'm completely insanely addicted to a 35-1-4, a 50-1-2. Right. So after hundreds of thousands of photographs have gone through that lens, I know what that composition is going to look like before I even get there. I know where I want her. And that was crazy looking at that sequence, knowing that Jesus, that took 18 seconds to get her out of the, from that first shot, the seventh one is 18 seconds. And those two photographs I got when she's looking at me, that's all that exists and we're gone. So that composition has got to be so automatic. It's just got to be so, I'm dropping to one knee. How I ended up in that one perfect spot that aligns all these things is, is you know, up for the, the you know, the gods of, you know, creativity. But, you did. Um, I mean, seriously, this shot is, well, this is what it's about. I mean, this is really, so I have a question for you unrelated to that shot yeah. now. And one of the one of the things about photojournalism is obviously there are journalistic integrity issues, right? Yeah. Yeah. We don't want journalists to make fake images. Yeah. But you know, and every publication and every outlet has different rules. There are uh, ASMP guidelines, but then each individual news station or newspaper or news outlet may have their own different guidelines. Getty has their own guidelines. The generally accepted rule of thumb is you're allowed to crop, you're allowed to color correct, you're allowed to dodge and burn because you could do all of those in a traditional darkroom. Yeah. Now, the truth is Ansel Adams in a traditional darkroom effectively did Photoshop work, right? I mean, the guy did magic in a darkroom. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going by, you can do whatever you did in a traditional darkroom, all hats are off at that point. So my question to you is when you're shooting, this is commercial, that's different. When you're shooting photojournalism, though, what are the what are the things you limit yourself to doing in post? Well, you do you you will crop an image, I'm assuming. No, I mean, okay. that's something that's something that I it's 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 a different world with the color and the digital now. But that was what the black and white triax was about. That was why I was so insistent about the cameras being full frame, because I had the. I would always, in all of my photographs, we have to take it all off now, but there's always the rebate edge. So I show that rebate edge in every single black and white photograph that's there. That's how I print them. And that's how I conceive them. That's how I see them. You know, if it's if it's an advertising shot, because I've done a lot of advertising in black and white, and I'm shooting Tri-X, and it's not going to be full frame because that's not what the client's interested in, or we've got you know, part of a leg here or something happened there, then obviously that's a whole different space. Right, but right. And there's different whole... rules involved. Yeah. But but that's one of the things I've always argued, though, with photojournalism is effectively a photojournalist that doesn't crop in post is still cropping yeah. because you're choosing a 35 yeah. versus a 24 versus a 70 to 200. Yeah. You're choosing to step forward with that prime or step back. So you're choosing what to include to tell the story and in my opinion, actually, more importantly, what not to include. Yeah, yeah, there's to, obviously to, thousands. To, yeah, to tell that story. So here's a another weird photojournalism documentary question, because I've got an expert on it. I've got to ask these. Photojournalism is a tough thing. Sometimes you get one shot. Like for me, I had a drummer look at me straight across the stage, smile at me. And when I was done, I nodded at him and he nodded back like, cool, I hope you got the shot. Yeah. And somehow the symbol pulled focus. And I missed that shot. And I'm yeah. mad. He was smiling right at me. It's not horrible. It's slight, yeah. but it bugs me, right? Because it was right there for me. Yeah. What, what, what goes through your head? Obviously, you can't go back and do it. I'm just curious you know, we all beat each other, beat ourselves up. What goes through your head if you've got a critical shot in front of you and you realize later you missed it? Not saying that you ever do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, I'm, I'm always shooting in, in manual and I'm not on autofocus. So everything that I'm oh, interesting. Okay. off. So for me, it is that control, um, you know, of that space. So it's not going to pull focus and grab the symbol when I'm back focused on the subject. So it's, um, it's just a unique experience for all of us and what we do and how we bring ourselves to our work. And it's what works for me. I mean, I prefer the camera on manual. I prefer to have a light meter and, you know, I prefer everything on, on manual. So I have control of everything. So it's just, so we all, we all work differently, you know? 
Yeah. Oh, no, I, I totally agree. So let me ask you the, the, the one critical question that I, I can't get out of here without asking. Helicopter view, because obviously this we could do an hour show on this question. Right. But the helicopter, you know, short answer to this. What makes a great documentary image, photojournalistic image? The most compelling images, you know, for me, are the accurate representation of someone's soul and someone's experience. And that is something that is given either by that subject to you and you're also giving of yourself to them. So a photograph, again, for me, is not something that you take. I'm given photographs, whether it's a polar bear in the Arctic Circle, an individual in Darfur, someone in a mining situation, in, you know, mountaintop removal in West Virginia, all these different places. These images are created by two people. There's the incredible person that's in front of me with their unbelievable power, courage, and strength that they possess in their lives. And I'm there. Their as vulnerability. Witness. Yeah. And I'm there as witness. So that image is given to me or it's not. And that's one thing that's really difficult to really to transcend that moment is when you find that image and you know it's in their eyes. Like as crazy as that is, I knew I had that image in two. So I told her, let's go, let's, let's get out of here. Robert Kennedy Jr. was the same way. I photographed, you know, a number of other artists and people that are some, you know, Alice Waters and you just know it. You see that resonance of soul. And then you look at it, even on that viewfinder, it's like, it's there. I know I've got it. It's the resonance of soul that's been transferred through this digital medium, through the lens, through my soul and into the camera. And that image has a very powerful, you know, impact for me. And it, it's there to tell the story of their lives. Sometimes of someone who's like Nev Campbell, sometimes it's someone in Darfur, a child, you know, in the midst of the nightmare of, you know, child labor, in the city of the dead in Cairo, you know, all of it comes through, you know, me and all of it has to be in interpreted and all of it has to come down to my emotional integrity. When I'm working in Cambodia doing a story on landmines, everything that's different, Steve, about that approach, by how I look and the energy I feel that comes from me towards that individual. And the most important question that I ask myself or that comes through me is the person I'm photographing, are they a landmine victim? Or are they a landmine survivor? And those two words change everything about even what I project outwards. This is a landmine survivor. Survivor. Incredible power. Incredible strength. Noble. Strength that I do not, nor will I ever have. As opposed to, I'm photographing a landmine victim. All these people are victims. Victims, victims, victims. And it's such a different word victim versus survivor and that energy in and of itself that flows through me as I'm looking at the people that I'm photographing and sharing in that experience, you know, is everything. And that's where that truth comes through the image and what I'm given through the subject and through the lens of what we eventually bring home and share, you know, with a lot of different people in a lot of different spaces and museums and books. And, but that's what I'm responsible for. I'm, I'm responsible for the distillation of this individual soul. And to tell their story, and if I can do it in one image, that's the goal too. But um, it's definitely a journey, and it's been um, it's been extraordinary. Well, you you have documented uh, the human story in so many ways, and it is it is truly an honor to have you on. I appreciate all of your work, and I encourage everybody to go to behindtheshot.tv. Check out Colin's work at uh, his website. Let's just go through your website again really quick. It's colinfinlay.com. Yep. F-I-N-L-A-Y, C-O-L-I-N-F-I-N-L-A-Y.com. And you're also Colin Finlay on Instagram and yep. great Instagram feed. Go follow him on Instagram as well. And Colin, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I, I dig your work too. I really love Iggy Pop. God, if you were there, was he playing with the Stooges? 
or was yeah. that just oh no 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 not the Stooges no it's okay. it's his latest band yeah okay yeah because because Ron Ashton they they they, they did that tour of the Stooges and, and if you caught that I've got I've got chills on my arm just thinking of you being there so that must have been really powerful you've got beautiful work Stephen really Iggy is still amazing on stage by the way he and oh, and yeah. by the way people go to, when you look at ColinFinley.com uh, Colin also is a music photographer. He's got shots of Roger Daltrey up there and a bunch of other people. So check out the entire library of his work because uh, it's amazing actually that that you are the music photographer as well and a musician. So <laughs> a lot of things that you do. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you so very much. And let me just say on camera, because he's going to hear this, I'm sure. Scott Heath, thank you so much for helping me get Colin on the show because it means a lot to me. So before we close out, a couple of quick things. First of all, a reminder, the Flickr thing I mentioned at the beginning of the show, join Flickr, free account, paid account, sign up or, or join the behind the shot group on Flickr, submit your images, everybody comments on them and we have a lot of fun there. But if you tag them with the Flickr tag, BTS critique, all one word, Flickr tag, not hashtag. That then makes those pictures eligible for the critique shows that Don Komarechka and I are doing. We only air those on the Behind the Shot YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash behind the shot. And uh, we record those and we've now started streaming those live. So we've got a lot going on there. Again, to everybody, as always, thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you would drop us a review in iTunes, both a star review and a written review, it would be appreciated. You can always reach out to me. You'll see my social media stuff and website stuff popping up on screen if you're watching the video. If you're not watching the video, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're not watching the video, uh, it's Steve Brazel. It's like the country Brazil, but two L's on Instagram and on Twitter or behind the shot TV on Instagram and Twitter. I try and answer everybody as, as often as I can, of course, barring too many of them, at which point I don't get to them quickly, but I will get to them sooner or later to everybody else. Thank you so much for watching. I always appreciate your stopping by. This is behind the shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers like Colin. Uh, and get a better insight into how they do their photography and why they make the choices that they do. We'll see you on the next show.